<laughs> so we got Joe Maurer from Eau Claire's West Side saying he would like fair maps. Ingmar from Stout interested in what's happening. Donna from Dresser. My dad from Menominee. Larissa and Terry from Roberts. Pat, good to see you. Jan and Patrick from Menominee, good to see you too. Bob and Hudson, Ann and River Falls. Patty in New Richmond wanted to learn more about dealing with politics. My dad is concerned about democracy. Um, Joe wanted to see a strong impact about the state Supreme Court. This is great to see everybody chiming in here. Lorreen and Mike from Menominee, Pat from River Falls. Looks like we're all where we need to be and we're all in really good company tonight. Looking forward to seeing some more um, introductions rolling in here. Uh, I wanna just share some thoughts with you um, about what brings me into this room and why I'm here uh, tonight with you and what brings me into this work. Um, and it starts with the fact that I really love democracy. Uh, last month on election day, I worked the polls like I do every election day. Uh, I got up at 5 a.m. and it was still dark outside and I made coffee in my kitchen trying to be quiet so I wouldn't wake up my kids and my wife. Uh, I got out the door and I arrived to the polls at 6 a.m. to start setting up. And there's something very peaceful about that moment before the polls open up. You have this empty room with empty voting booths and it's like the quiet before the storm and you're like anticipating what's about to happen. Uh, and then the room fills up with people. Uh, and it's almost like this massive civic ritual where everybody's getting in line, uh, people walking through the door, signing the poll book, getting their ballot, disappearing into their voting booth to make this private decision that's gonna have very real public uh, consequences. And it's not just happening in that room, it's happening in rooms across the state, across the country. Uh, and I just really love being a poll worker. Um, and one of the things I really love most about it is whether I'm checking in voters or registering voters, uh, I don't know which way they're going to vote. And I kind of like that. Each person comes through the line and I get to look them right in the eye as a neighbor, as a fellow citizen, as a human being, and I can't tell if they're Republican, Democrat, Independent, Socialist, Green, Libertarian, and it doesn't really matter um, because I get to thank them for voting. And then I get to repeat it again and again and again throughout the day. And it really is a beautiful thing. I love witnessing elections from the perspective of a poll worker, just because it reminds me that democracy is just all about people. Uh, and that root of democracy, demos, literally means people, the rule of people. Um, and that's a really important thing to always be reminding ourselves about, uh, because that's what wakes me up at 5 a.m. to go to the polls. It's what brings me on the call with you tonight. I feel like our state, Wisconsin, is at its best when people have the power. And I feel like our state, Wisconsin, is not at its best when power gets consolidated in fewer and fewer hands. Um, and we're gonna hear a lot from our guests tonight about how the mechanisms of democracy are being threatened. We're gonna hear about voting rights, gerrymandering, threats on municipal clerks, the future of the Wisconsin Election Commission. But I just wanna underline before we go into that conversation that our fight is also about something much larger and it's about whether people have power. Uh, the people who are closest to the problem, the people who are impacted by the decisions made at the state capitol, the same people whose eyes that I get to look into when I'm handing them a poll, a, ba a ballot at the polls. Um, so this is really a fight about not just like the mechanics of democracy, about what kind of state we want to live in. What kind of state we want to live in. Do we want to be a state where people have a voice or not? Uh, because I believe Wisconsin, people care about each other. That's who we are. When there's a blizzard, we will shovel our neighbor's driveway. We will stop on the side of the road if we see somebody has a flat tire. We're good people. We care about each other. We follow the golden rule. And I think 
that if you look back through the state's politics, you see that reflected. You know, we were the first state to establish a minimum wage, first state to establish unemployment insurance, workman's comp, first state to ratify the 19th Amendment to give women the right to vote. We came up with the, democ with the Wisconsin idea, uh, you know, to make our state a laboratory of democracy. We fund our funded our public schools so kids all had a fair shot. Um, you know, we're the state of Bob LaFollette, you know, who fought against the monopoly power of corporations. Um, we're like Joe Maurer just said, we are the state of the Green Bay Packers, a publicly owned football team that funnels its profits back into the community instead of, instead of into the hands of a billionaire owner. That's who we are. And it's about people and it's about taking care of people. And it's not just about the mechanics of democracy, although that's very important. Um, but I know right now it's been a hard 15, 20 years in, the, in Wisconsin, right? It feels like we've strayed from that original vision of what our state can be, where people's voices are important. Uh, but I also just wanna offer that democracy isn't just about voting and just about elections, which are incredibly important, but it's also about organizing. And I have to say this because organizing is in the name of our organization. Um, it's about that hand-to-hand, -hand, person to person work of building the kind of world that we want to live in. It's not going to happen unless we're doing that work. It's a question of how do we engage each other to build a public life and act powerfully together? How do we strategize together? How do we relate to each other? How do we reach out to new people beyond the choir? Not just the activists, but not just the people who agree with us. Um, and how do we push back against the narratives that divide us, that tell us that we are different and that our self-interests are different. Um, how do we build those bridges based on our values and self-interest? Because if there's one thing I've learned as an organizer, it's that we have a lot in common and we have a lot to fight for together. Uh, and that our self-interests self are very, we all want the same thing, right? We wanna raise a family. We wanna be able to uh, put food on the table. We wanna live with respect and dignity. So that's to me about the heart of democracy, demos, people. Um, and that's the, how I feel tonight, seeing all your faces. That's how I feel on election day. Um, and the organizing opportunity we have in front of us this year is the Wisconsin State Supreme Court race in April of 2023. So I'm gonna stop talking right now, but before I stop, I'm just gonna let you know that I'm going to encourage you all to think about what role you're gonna play in this race. Um, we have about four months, and I want you to consider how you're going to help us move Wisconsin back in the direction of the people uh, so that people have a voice in shaping the decisions that impact them. We've got four months, but the work starts now. And I'll just leave you with a quote from my hero, Bob La Follette, uh, from a speech that he made in 1919 from the Senate floor, which was, if the people want a government of their own, they must do the work of making it their own. And that's what Wisconsin's all about. And I'm so proud to be with you all tonight. And I'm so glad you're here. And I'm so glad our panelists are here. And I'm gonna introduce them. Um, and then we're gonna hear from them and then we're gonna have an opportunity to ask questions. Feel free while uh, you're listening to the panelists uh, to drop questions in the chat. Um, and then when they're done speaking, um, we'll be able to get to your questions. We'll pull a few out. Uh, I doubt we'll be able to get to all your questions because we have limited time tonight. And I know this is a very inquisitive group. Uh, you'll likely have a lot of questions. Um, but with no further ado, I want to introduce Anjali Basin, the Civic Engagement Director at the Wisconsin Conservation Voters. Anjali, could you say hi? I, I think I can't even see you. Hi, yes, and, and you pronounce it Anjali. Anjali, thank you very much. Thank you for that correction. Thank you for thank you for being with us tonight. Yeah, glad to be here. And we also have Dan Kaufman, who is a frequent contributor to the New Yorker and the author of you know, contributor to the New Yorker and the New York Times and the author of The Fall of Wisconsin, which I have my copy of right here. And if you have not read this, I have to put a plug in uh, for it. Uh, it's an important book to read. And if you're on this call tonight, I think you'd get a lot out of reading this book. Really happy to have Dan uh, from uh, calling in from New York. Uh, Dan, are you there? 
Yes, I am, Bill. Thank you, and thank you for the plug. I'm uh, calling in from the Catskill Mountains. Uh, sorry it's so dark here. Hopefully you can see me well enough. Um, I'm in my laundry room, and we have uh, poor lighting. <laughs> but anyway, it's great to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. It's great to see you. And then last but not least, Matt Rothschild, the executive director of the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, uh, who who told us before the call he wasn't feeling well today. So let's all give him a round of applause for <laughs> powering through his, uh, his illness today and, and being with us. Thanks, Matt. Um, so again, if you all have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat as, you're, uh, as we're hearing our panelists. Um, the first question we want uh, to ask them and have them wrestle with is just about the current state of democracy in Wisconsin. Uh, where are we at right now? with where democracy is at and where the levers of democracy are at and how people are engaging uh, with democracy. Um, and how do we get here? Um, I'm gonna have Anjali kick us off. So, uh, Bill, thanks. And, and to everybody first off, just thank you for all of your work. Thanks for, having this event tonight and including us it's it's really always very um heartwarming and exciting to see so many people who are so interested in democracy and fair representation and you know really identifying opportunities to make wisconsin a state and work in which people's voices can be heard so i first just want to start by saying thanks to all of you um, thanks, Bill, to the question in terms of where we are today. I suspect Matt, Dan, and I may all answer this from slightly different lenses. I thought I would just talk, Matt and I talked a little bit earlier today, and I thought I would just talk broadly about some of the political context. So as all of us here know, we just had a very contentious set of elections in November. So we have a split government with a Democratic governor and um majority republic you know our legislature is it's you know the majorities are, are very much controlled by republicans we were able the state was able to um keep the governor's veto so you know so that that is good news so there is a, there is really an anchor when it comes to if we're looking at democracy attacks on democracy in terms of the state legislature. And I think for, for many of us here, if we've been paying attention, if you're reading the newspaper, if you're turning on the radio, you know, we're over the last of course of the last three years, um, we've, you know, we've very much experienced hearing about the big lie, you know, and a number of different election conspiracy theories um, on a you know, quite regular basis. And so I think one thing contextually to think about is that at this point, you know, whether whether we will see, I think, how, the big lie narrative and what will happen with that, it's unclear. You, you know, I think in November, we saw a number of folks across the country running for election on the big lie who lost. We also saw some folks who were, you know, at, at the state capitol on January 6th in an insurrectionist positions um, re elected, some newly elected, some re-elected. And so I think there's just a lot of uncertainty about, about where things will go in terms of election conspiracy theories, the big lie, you know, whether that will continue to have traction or not. I think much of that might depend on who the candidates are, you know, in, in 2024 and upcoming elections. One thing to note is, you know, I do think we may see a reduction in the number of things that are happening in Wisconsin through the state legislature focused on, on the big lie. We don't know that for sure. We're waiting to see what committee chair positions will be, but it, it you know, there's, there's some uncertainty, but there may not be quite as large of a focus from the, the state legislature. What I would say is if we think about the, and I know Bill already talked about this, but if we think about the, you know, we have a split government. So we have a Democratic governor, uh, Republican state legislature, you know, uh, Tony Evers was a, you know, vetoed at least 10 anti-democracy bills in 2020, 
to what I what we would anticipate is that that would be the case again in, in this cycle. One thing I would note, though, which Bill mentioned earlier, is that we do have a state Supreme Court race coming up in April, and that that race will essentially whoever is elected will be able will be deciding vote when it comes to things like voting rights, fair maps. If we think about all of the big, you know, all the things, all the court cases um, that came up in front of the state Supreme Court after the 2020 election with um, efforts to try and overturn Wisconsin election results. And so this coming election that's going to be happening in April in Wisconsin, I think, is one of the most important races we will see. It will have impact on not only Wisconsin, but really election results across the country, right? And so if we think about, let's just play out a potential scenario, right? So let's say in 2024, you had a candidate on the ballot who once again uh, decided that they were going to prop, you know, election conspiracy theories, big lie theory. They were going to refuse to concede the election the composition of the state Sup supreme court would have a big impact on whether whether uh votes you know the will of the voter was respected and so i think whether we're looking at at democracy from that framework or if we're looking at fair maps so one thing to note is who are, so okay State Supreme Court is supposed to be nonpartisan. All of the courts are supposed to be nonpartisan. I think all of us, if, if we're living in the reality, if we're looking at, we know the the courts have become highly partisan over the last few years. So essentially, whoever wins in April will really be the deciding factor in terms of who controls the courts. Um, and so I think there's, you know, if if somebody who believes in democracy and fair maps is elected. There's a real opportunity um, to relitigate the maps that we currently have in Wisconsin. And this, this last cycle was the first time the state Supreme Court actually uh, was the decider on, on, on our redistricting and our maps. And so any litigation would be new. And, and there are a number of lawyers who think they could make a compelling case based on the state constitution. But I'll go ahead and close now and turn it over to Matt or Dan. Thanks, Anjali. Um, Matt, would you like to take it away? Sure. Uh, and, and it's great to be with you, Bill uh, and Janelle, and thanks for having me with you. It's great to see so many activists who I've met along the road over the many, many years. It's great to be on a panel of Anjali and Dan. It's great to see my cousin Margie on this call. Hi, Margie. Um, Look, I want to give a kind of a historical perspective as to how we got here. And the way I look at it is over the last uh, 40 years, 40, 42 years, 45 years, it's been kind of a counter revolutionary period because we've had a lot of progressive social pressure at the grassroots and movement organizing, but the right wing has managed to exercise so much power. Uh, and you can go back to Reagan and his attack on government itself and his attack on labor unions. You can go back to the Koch brothers and their 50 year effort uh, to uh, transform American pro uh, po politics from the right. Uh, you can go back to Paul Weyrich, one of the finder, founders of the social conservative movement and uh, back in 1980 saying, uh, we do better when fewer people vote. I mean, this was pretty explicit that they, uh, they, the far right, uh, do better when they can suppress the vote. And we saw that, as Anjali said, with all the anti-voting bills here in Wisconsin. And so that's kind of the context. I mean, we had Scott Walker, of course, as you all remember, who is kind of the bastard son of Newt Gingrich and uh, taking, uh, trying to pretend to be Ronald Reagan and dropping a bomb on labor here, as Dan talks about in great detail in his tremendous book. So we had all of that. And underlying the, this counter-revolutionary uh, movement or this right-wing movement has been uh, the inability of capitalism to deliver the goods and this constant appeal to racism. And we saw this appeal to racism here in Wisconsin in the last election in the most grotesque way when 
uh, Ron Johnson himself in his own campaign ads that he himself wrote were racist ads. And then in the $29 million spent by the misnamed outside group, uh, Wisconsin Truth Pack, funded and founded by Diane Hendricks, the richest woman in Wisconsin, head of ABC Supply, who whispered in Scott Walker's ear before he attacked labor, when are you going to turn Wisconsin into a, a, a red state? When are you going to turn Wisconsin into a right to work state? And he said, notoriously, of course, first, we've got to divide and conquer. And one of the ways they've been dividing and conquering is through racism. And so Diane Hendricks and Richard Eline were the ones who funded those ads that splatter all over our screens during election time saying, uh, you know, Mandela Barnes is different. He's dangerous. Uh, and they made him out to be the most dangerous black man in Wisconsin. And it was just a crude, very explicit uh, appeal to racism. Look at the results. Uh, Governor Evers got 116,000 more votes than Mandela Barnes did. A huge chunk of those uh, are, uh, in my opinion, because of the uh, these racist appeals. So I think that's kind of how we got to where we are. I mean, we did go through the whole Michael Gableman circus, Janelle Branch and Circus. She's now running for state Senate, by the way. Uh, there was this effort to uh, the Tim Rampton, who ran for governor on the Republican side, to retroactively uh, retract the votes of Wisconsin from the Electoral College, something that even Robin Voss said is unconstitutional and we can't do. So there are these efforts on the far right here in Wisconsin, both among some of these crazy legislators and also at the base that is part and parcel of a, the larger anti-democracy movement in Wisconsin that we're facing, uh, an anti-democracy movement that consists of the Trump cult, uh, white nationalists, which can't be, the threat of which can't be underestimated, uh, you know, a wave of irrationalism in QAnon and things like that and COVID denial and November 2020 denialism and climate change denialism that Ron Johnson uh, regurgitates. And then the right-wing media infrastructure that feeds all of this. There is a good counter uh, action to the right-wing media infrastructure in Wisconsin that I just want to point out as one sign of hope. And then I'll give another sign of hope. And that is that there's a, a group called Civic Media that's buying up radio stations all over Wisconsin uh, and setting up a progressive radio network. Civic Media is uh, outflowing from uh, Devil Radio in Madison, Wisconsin, and Milwaukee, founded by Michael Crute. But now there's an investor uh, who is finally understood, and I wish more investors had understood this 40 years ago, how important it is to build a media infrastructure to counter right-wing media. The other sign of hope I want to point to is just, uh, other than all the great grassroots groups and the great progressive nonprofit groups, is the new group Law Forward that uh, entered our space in the last two years is giving us a lot of muscle uh, in the courtrooms across Wisconsin, including the Wisconsin State Supreme Court. And yes, that race is pivotally important uh, in the near term. So that's kind of how I'd set the table. It's really, I'll just uh, add on here. It's great to see you all. And thanks, Bill, for having me. Thanks to Matt and Anjali. I agreed with um, so much of what you guys said. So. Uh, I might be a bit redundant, but um, I think what I have looked at over the past since um, I would say that in some ways the greatest threat to democracy to me is this incredible class divide that's growing and growing. It has been growing um, for 40 years, or I would argue even began in the Jimmy Carter presidency when um, Paul Volcker was named to be the head of the Fed and they raised interest rates and it kind of set in motion a great wave of deindustrialization across the Midwest, transformed it into what's called the Rust Belt. Um, and I think that is kind of foundational to some of the problems we've had. And I think there's another facet to it in rural areas, which is the economic consolidation that you've seen, this incredible monopolization of virtually everything from you know, the feed mill to the retail to d dairy industry, agriculture has been incredibly consolidated. And I think the effects of that are this incredible resentment and anger that unfortunately we're missing often a Bob LaFollette type figure to um, kind of direct that anger in a constructive way towards the real perpetrators. And I think 
uh, essentially that is one reason that Trump triumphed and that kind of Trumpism, whether he endures or not, is still with us. Um, it's no mystery. You remember the signs around Act 10 when uh, there were people with signs saying that, you know, the first thing that Hitler did was get rid of the trade unions. Um, and I think that's really important. And I think the attacks on labor were so significant. They didn't start with Act 10, but a kind of new wave of it began then. Um, and uh, it was sort of really interesting because in Wisconsin, you had also the beginning of a great pushback that I think is still going now. And I think is one of those hopeful signs. I mean, in, in some ways, I would argue that, you know, the Act 10 uprising, um, you know, influenced and kind of set the stage for Occupy and, and the revival and interest in labor today. At the same time, you have labor unions at their lowest level, um, since the 20s, probably. Um, so I think it's a, a very complicated picture, but I do think that um, things like the state Supreme Court race are incredibly important. All of the changes in Wisconsin, virtually all of the major ones over the past decade have been at least codified by the court. Um, at the same time, I think um, groups like yours are really important because there's something foundational that also has to be addressed to really make democracy more robust. And that goes into Wisconsin's kind of unique traditions. And I think it's an incredible template. And I'm glad, Bill, you talked about it. Um, and a lot of that history is in my book. Um, it really is an incredible American tradition, uh, maybe shared somewhat by Minnesota, of this sort of native social democrat tradition and one of the hallmarks of that tradition was a really strong public institutions and a belief in public institutions and i think one of the reasons you had such a robust democracy in wisconsin is there was a general equality economic equality that kind of underpinned all of these advances and achievements and this belief in public institutions that was really important some of the Scandinavian immigrants that came here, as well as the German immigrants that were fleeing this uh, failed revolution in the 1840s. These traditions were really important, not just for the state, but for the country as a whole. And I think if, if anyone you know, could revive that, because it, it's not something that's imported. It's really native to the Midwest. It's, it's a very crucial aspect to why um, Wisconsin was so successful at innovating these progressive achievements. And I think if you look at LaFollette's speeches, so much of them were about economic justice and a fear and a distrust of corporate power. And his great, um, you know, kind of mentor was actually a Wisconsin Supreme Court justice, one of them. Two, one of them was John Bascom. And the other was a guy named Edward Ryan, who famously gave this speech to the University of Wisconsin Law School that LaFollette heard. And he said, you know, to the effect of the question will arise and arise in your day, um, whether or not we shall be ruled by, I'm paraphrasing, um, patriotic free men or the feudal serfs of corporate capital. And I think you can look back 130 years ago and you can see that they were facing these incredible problems of corporate control of our politics. And I think that is all the more true. It started with Buckley versus Vallejo and then was, you know, um, ramped up with Citizens United. And this whole tradition of Wisconsin's clean government and the democratic participation and the citizen involvement was predicated on there not being a lot of money in our politics. And that's something that Matt has devoted his life to exposing. And I think it's it's these foundational things that are kind of trickier than solving or winning a state Supreme Court race or, or winning, you know, back the governorship, which I think is tremendously important. But um, these other problems, as Matt said, and somebody, uh, a wonderful assemblywoman in my book, Chris Taylor, who followed around, who joined ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, to try to expose them, you know, said after Trump won, you know, we, um, they have an infrastructure and we don't. And I think that's kind of, I suppose, in some ways, what Bill is trying to do here and what 
groups like Law Forward, which is, I agree with Matt, is tremendously important, as well as uh, these new kind of progressive radio stations, because this infrastructure, the rights infrastructure is incredibly powerful and they've been working at it for 50 years. There's a famous memo by a future Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell when he was uh, working for the U.S. Chamber of Congress and he drafted a secret memo basically outlining the right strategy that we need to take over everything, government, academia, and so on and so forth. And they were largely successful in this period in the early 70s when it seemed like the triumph of a kind of citizen-oriented, consumer-oriented, popular movement was actually being beginning to be undermined by groups like the Cato Foundation and so on, and ALEC, which Weyrich um, kind of took over in 1974. And all of this infrastructure started and they had a very long view. And I think, you know, you're, you also have to think about both the, you know, the April election and also the long term and what that means in terms of rebalancing um, the society because the express, the anti-democratic impulses, I think, are a symptom in some ways of this incredible inequality that has been allowed to fester and grow. And you see it like just the other uh, couple months ago, um, National Bureau of Economic Research released a report that 2%, um, 50% of the country owns just 2% of the wealth. And I mean, that's just really not sustainable, I don't think, in the long term. And of course, labor was an important rebalancer, and that has been largely wiped out. So I think those are the things that I think are going on in terms of what the anti-democratic movement, even if they're not readily apparent with the stop the steal rhetoric and the crazy, you know, violent outbursts, which I did write about in a, in a piece um, last summer when they, the attacks on the clerks and so on. And, um, and I think it, it operates on both levels, both the immediate, the, the short term and the the longer term. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Matt, Anjali, Dan. Um, I'll take a few questions from the chat here and let any of you react to them. I'm going to maybe have Sarah T um, dropped a question in. Would you like to come off a of mute and, and just verbalize your question, Sarah? Um, <clears throat> sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So um, when it comes to gerrymandering, um, one thing that, you know, I think about is that, you know, you have these districts that are heavily Republican um, and not a whole lot of Democrats. Well, now we're finding that more and more progressives are moving out of those districts. How do we find reliable, good candidates? in those districts to even run against the Republicans in those districts if we continue to have these redistricting where it's majority or Republicans. So that means there's a decrease in even the pool of Democrats who would even be able to run. I, I have a potential response unless Matt or Dan. Go for it, Angela. Um, so I, I think you're identifying a real challenge. And I think one, one way to think about it, we have races happening at all different levels. So we have local races, we have statewide races. Um, and in those areas, one of the things I think we've seen is that while very much, very often the statewide races, whether it's for our state assembly or Senate are highly polarized, the area may be very, um, the concentrations, um, you know, whether they're gerrymandered or or the the demographic area moving in a certain direction, we haven't seen that same polarization at the local level. And so, I one thing I would think about is really thinking about your city councils, your school boards, where are their opportunities as as a group, how can you build power, right? So I know Dan talked a lot about like the, the larger infrastructure. There's also a component, you know, when you're in this work every day to be able to have victories and being able to identify where there are level, levers of power. And often you can have levers of power on the local level. 
Thanks, Anjali. I would just also like to remind the audience that Grow Action is a nonpartisan organization that uh, doesn't align with particular. And this is okay. Sorry, you're not not scolding you. Just like making the disclaimer, right? So everyone knows. Um, happy happy to keep talking about this. Just wanted wanted folks to know that we are a nonpartisan organization. Continue, please. Matt or Dan, if you have reactions to that. Well, just to say, I think the gerrymandering has a really pernicious effect on democracy. And like you could see it, one of the people that I followed, a wonderful woman um, named Lori Compass, she's in my book. You probably remember her. She was a wedding photographer that decided to challenge Scott Fitzgerald. She lived in Fort Atkinson. Um, and she ran a really incredible spirited campaign, really dynamic person. Uh, captivating local resident, very intelligent, um, but it was virtually impossible for her to win in that district. And in fact, apparently Fitzgerald called her afterward and said, you know, when she conceded, um, or she called him and said, you know, I'd hate to run against you in a 50-50 district. And I think, but then what happened afterwards is, is Lori became, you know, somewhat, and I think there's a withering, you know, it, you don't want to be a sacrificial lamb again and again. Um, not that she was, but I think it was hard to maintain any kind of cohesion um, for a lot of people in these heavily gerrymandered districts. And, and uh, you know, in some ways, I would say the same thing on the Democratic side. It, it doesn't really help democracy if it's a foregone foregone conclusion who the winner will be. Um, and I think. Um, that kind of atrophying is another symptom of the sort of decline of Wisconsin. I think you can see these things in Wisconsin so clearly because it does have this past that was very citizen driven more than almost any other state. Um, the capital was designed for easy access for the ordinary citizen. It was not uncommon to just for an ordinary citizens to meet with their state legislators. Um, and that all changed. And I think, um, you know, and when you saw it, Act 10 was a very vivid, you know, example where they weren't listening. Their their constituents were really not even of Wisconsin anymore. Um, it was these dark money groups, but they didn't have to worry mm -hmm. about um, people, even within their own district that were upset. Um, I think you saw a few exceptions, a Republican state senator named Dale Schultz, who voted against Act 10 because he said, you know, he went to a meeting out in Spring Green, I think, and there was like 500 against it and two people for it. And he basically just listened to his constituents. Um, and that was um, kind of had been the, you know, the old school Wisconsin politician model. And it had become really anachronistic by the time, you know, Act 10 had happened. And I think gerrymandering is, is, it just has this way of um, depressing people, I think, in a way that's that's hard to quantify just in terms of, but I think, you know, um, just to acknowledge your point that it's hard to find uh, good candidates when the outcome is, you know, already kind of known what the result will be. I'd just like to disagree a little with Dan there in that I think it's important to run to have contested elections. It's important for democracy to have contested elections. And it's important if you're a Democrat or a progressive to challenge an incumbent, even in cases where you know they're gonna lose. Uh, like Glenn Grothman ran unopposed this year. I, th I think that's, you know, if you're a progressive, I, I think that's a mistake. I think it's important to challenge uh, even someone who's in a super safe seat and try to educate uh, your fellow citizens and present an alternative because the long-term battle is not just to get your own people out but to try to convince as bill said earlier some of those folks who don't already agree with you that your view of what is right and just and beautiful uh going forward is a better view than what the glenn Grothmans of this world are presenting but uh that's just a quibble i mean in, in response to the question you know i think it's a mistake to view as some of the media do that, you know, rural Wisconsin is right wing and Milwaukee and Madison are progressive. I mean, look at Bayfield, Ashland, Douglas County. Uh, all three of those counties went for Tony Evers by 57 or 58 percent. And yet because of gerrymandering, there's no single Democrat representing those 57 percent in the state legislatures. There's not a state assembly person. There's not a state senator because the maps were rigged. Uh, you know, they could have drawn a map that got uh, all the 
uh, a majority of Democrats in those counties or just preserve those counties as one district itself if they had enough people in there. Uh, and that would give them a, a fairly safe Democratic representative or at least a, a good shot at it. But the rigging the maps is a, a, a serious problem. There is widespread support across the aisle for getting rid of gerrymandering in poll after poll and 56 out of the 72 counties, as that map over my shoulder shows, if uh, adopted resolutions urging the legislature to ban gerrymandering. Uh, and we do have a couple, we usually do have a couple Republican co-sponsors, uh, at least formally endorsing the idea. But, you know, as one of the people in the chat said, you know, if the Republicans are in power because uh, in part of gerrymandering, why would they want to get rid of gerrymandering? And this is this is the whole problem that we have with the U.S. Supreme Court decision in the Common Cause Rucho case, uh, where Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, in the deciding vote, admitted on the one hand that gerrymandering, hyperpartisan gerrymandering, was incompatible with our democratic principles, and then on the other hand, said we don't want to deal with it. Don't come knocking on our door with your gerrymandering cases. Uh, send it back to the states. Well, sending it back to the states where a state is still controlled by the party that gerrymandered the maps is a real catch-22. So that's the situation we're in here. I just want to say one thing, Matt. I wasn't saying it wasn't important. I was just describing the fact that it's uh, it has an effect, a pernicious effect on the people in that district. Like Lori, um, her morale sunk year after year when knowing that um, it's just describing the withering of local institutions, whether it's the local Democratic Party or or what have you, when um, the result is is essentially a foregone conclusion. I think it's important that every that an election should be contested. I just think it's also a reality that that is one of the side effects of gerrymandering that uh, is maybe underappreciated. This kind of attritional loss of morale and among some of the local residents living under a district like that. Yeah, no, that's a solid point. I get you. Thanks for the spirited conversation. We have a, uh, a question from Pete Hoff. Pete, would you mind coming off mute and sharing a question? Yeah, hi everyone, can you hear me? Yep. All right, yeah, I just had a question. I mean, uh, and, and this is, I'm not an expert on this. I'm, I am looking to be informed um, ultimately, but you know, just aware of the independent state legislature theory that, you know, was entertained by the Supreme Court at the federal level. And it, it seems like it's not getting traction, but I'm just curious if, if the panelists could speak a little bit more about what's the movement behind that particular theory and what might, uh, what might that mean in terms of Wisconsin and, and, and as far as ironcladding state legislatures to be, you know, essentially irrefutable in terms of uh, overseeing elections. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Well, I can take a quick swing at it because it follows up on this uh, U.S. Supreme Court case I was just talking about. So the uh, independent state legislature case that was just heard at the U.S. Supreme Court last week is a case about gerrymandering. Uh, the Republican dominated legislature in North Carolina had gerrymandered the rigs, uh, had rigged the maps, gerrymandered the maps in a real bad way. So uh, it went to the state Supreme Court in North Carolina and they ruled against those maps. They ruled it violated the state constitution. Well, the Republicans then went to the US Supreme Court saying in the US constitution, it says state legislatures should decide the time, place and manner of uh, federal elections and how to run federal elections in their state. So their argument was the state Supreme Courts have no say over what state legislatures do uh, in how the state legislatures run federal elections. Well, it's an extraordinary claim, and it's it's kind of preposterous, and I hope it's thrown out. But if it is, if it succeeds, then in the case of gerrymandering, let's just look at that. I mean, when it comes to a state that's dominated by one party that's already rigged the maps and benefited from the rigging of the maps, there's no way to go, no place for anyone to go. You can't go to the federal courts because Chief Justice Roberts said, "Go home, don't ever come back," and then you can't go to your even your state supreme court. Uh, if the state Supreme Court has reasonable people in the majority there, because the independent state legislature theory says basically the state legislature is paramount. So it, it would be a, a, a way of really uh, shutting down the discussion on how to solve gerrymandering. Even worse than that, 
uh, in a voting rights case, I mean, the state legislature, for instance, in a, in a question of, you know, who won in your state, the state legislature says, well, we're the ultimate determinant of that. Uh, and so, for instance, in Wisconsin, uh, the state legislature in, in 2020 could have said, you know, we don't really care about who you think won the vote. We're going to say it was Donald Trump. And then who's going to contest that if, if uh, the state Supreme Court can't get involved and maybe the, the federal courts can't get involved. So it's really a, uh, a theory that is radical and antithetical to the traditional U.S. system of checks and balances. So I'm hoping that um, a majority even of our currently uh, dominant right-wing U.S. Supreme Court will come to that conclusion. Yeah, just to add one thing, um, I think this whole thing, which is a fringe constitutional theory, comes out of a long-term right-wing strategy to put more power in the state legislatures because they are so easy to control as we've seen in fact i went to two i was able to go to two alec meetings and i remember one of the workshops was about how to repeal repealing the 13th amendment which is the direct election of senators it used to be the state legislatures and you think wow that's so outlandish but i think it's been moving you know they're, they're always pushing in that direction and wisconsin is like exhibit a for the utility of this strategy. I mean, virtually, you know, Act 10 is unrepealable, at least while, you know, until the state legislature could somehow be re remapped. So the, and um, any kind of substantial reform to rebalance it towards what the state used to be is, is almost impossible to achieve because the uh, Republicans have a vice grip on the state legislature. And I think, you know, you go back to groups like ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council and other ones, it's just a really, um, the right has been focusing on the states for decades um, in a way that um, the progressive side has, has not. And, you know, and I think in some ways you could see that, um, you know, during the Obama presidency, for example, when you had like 26 attorneys generals suing you know, the federal government over the expansion of Obamacare or some environmental laws. And I mean, I think they can, there's an ability to undermine um, a t kind of top-down power um, that is very important to to them. And they they saw the importance of that very early. And I think the, the case Matt was talking about that you asked about is a kind of extension of this relentless desire to put more power into state legislatures because of how easy they are to control. Thanks, Matt and Dan. And thanks to everybody for dropping all the questions in, your, in the chat. I'm sorry, we can't get to all of them. I do want to shift gears here and ask our panelists to look forward um, into the next year and beyond um, and really unpack for us what's at stake um, with the state Supreme Court race coming up and also beyond that as well. Um, where should our focus be? Where, where are the consequential levers that need to be pulled? Um, what's coming down the pipeline that we really need to be aware of as citizens? And uh, Anjali, maybe we'll kick it off with you. Bill, just to be clear in terms of your question, really, what looking forward, what are, what are, what should what should be on people's minds and radar? Yeah, yeah, and and I think if there's anything on your mind uh, regarding what's at stake with the Supreme Court race this year, it would be really helpful. Yeah, so I think that's you know I I alluded it to it earlier. For folks who care about conservation, for folks who care about democracy fair maps, voting rights, all of that is really a, on the table with a state Supreme Court race. As I mentioned earlier, whoever wins this election in April will really, you know, their party will control, have control over the court. And we have seen in Wisconsin many, de many decisions be made on party lines. I think if, even if we look back at the decisions regarding fair maps over the course of the last year, we, we can really see that play out. And so for, for folks who have concerns about those issues, this race is, 
is hugely critical. I would also say, you know, often I think in Wisconsin, the last few years, there's really been a cycle of, you know, every two, every two to four years trying to block a supermajority um, in the assembly or the Senate, you know, every four years trying to, if, if you care about voting rights or democracy or, you know, and, uh, reproductive rights, a host of different issues, really, you know, trying to reelect a governor who can, who can be a, a veto stop. And if, if you're able to have elect somebody to the court who is pro-democracy, who is pro-conservation, who is pro-reproductive rights, he'll have another place as a stopgap. So you'll have an, another lever that's available to really represent people and their voices. And, and, and many of the things that I think, you know, as Matt, Matt had referenced some of the different polls, if we ask, you know, percentage, you know, there's a larger percentage of people who agree with fair maps. There's a larger percentage of people who agree with reproductive rights. But the way our, our state legislature is set up, it, it's so gerrymandered that we don't, you know, there's a real disconnect there. And so I think there's a, 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 a real opportunity with the state Supreme Court. And I tend to answer the, you know, these questions. I, I identify as an activist. I've always, you know, whether I was 18 or 25 or working as a librarian or in my current role, you know, often trying to identify ways to improve, you know, sometimes it was at the university, you know, looking at indigenous rights. Sometimes it's been looking at what's happening, you know, what, where can we increase access through the Department of Transportation. And so for me, I often think about, when I think about where to concentrate energy, I think one of the fundamental things about organizing is to keep people engaged and to be able to have victories. There, there's many intellectual things we can, you know, posit, but at the end of the day, we're all humans and we all need encouragement and to feel like our are, are making a difference and having impact. And so if, if I were thinking about you know, not not only 2023, but 2023 into 2024, which I do do for my everyday job working with our C3 mobilization programs, I would be really looking at, you know, um, how do I have impact in April 2023? How, you know, are there people who maybe vote in some spring elections, but not all spring elections? Are there voters who might turn out for the governor's race, but but may not have historically turned out for the mayor's race? Is there a way to reach those people? Is there a way to, to help? You know, one thing that I think about with the state Supreme Court race, for the folks here, you're so engaged, probably thinking very deeply and very critically. I, I could imagine most of us also have friends or family who are just trying to manage their lives. They may have kids, they may themselves have health issues, They a host of different things. They may just not be super politically engaged, but they care about issues. And so, and they may not always be in, in the, the depth of, in the way that folks on this call might be. And so reaching out to those folks, helping them make the connection, helping them have the information they need to vote, helping them, you know, really be able to cast their ballot for April, I think would be, be very valuable and something very tangible that people can do every day in their lives. I would also be thinking out to 2024. So for example, you know, one thing that I think we've seen over the, the course of the last several years is how much local election administrators can have an impact on how people are able to access the ballot in their communities. So for example, if I were thinking out beyond 2024 about democracy or voting rights, or what are some practical things I could be doing to have a positive impact in my own community? I might be looking at working with my local clerk to see if we could have early voting hours, if we could have expanded early voting hours. So maybe they're on Sundays, maybe, you know, depending on what your, your situation is with young people and college campuses in your communities. For example, we know in, in some communities it's uh, students have to go very far to reach their polling place. We also know 
young voters turn out of all the all the demographics young voters are are least likely to turn turn out in high percentages you know so really finding opportunities you know maybe in your community if there's a whether there's a technical college or there's a, a you know a campus maybe there there could be an early voting site there i think there's a host of different a number of different things that folks can be working on and so those are some of the things i would really be i would be thinking in terms of the state Supreme Court race. And after the state Supreme Court race, I would be thinking about what, if I'm focused on demo democracy and voting rights, I'd be thinking about what I can do with my local clerks. If my big issue that I might care about is something like education or conservation, I'd be thinking about what can I do with my school board and what can I do with my local city council to, to really make a difference. Thanks for that message, Anjali. Um, Matt, I'm gonna have you uh, weigh in. I also wanna bounce a question that maybe you could be in a good position to answer from Larissa. She says, Wisconsin State Supreme Court race for dummies. What top to three to four issues are at stake? Well, yeah, I think it's a crucial uh, race coming up here in April. Yeah, uh, abortion is an issue that the new uh, Wisconsin, newly constituted Wisconsin Supreme Court is gonna deal with when this new justice comes out. Um, Josh Call, Attorney General of Wisconsin, already has a case challenging the 1849 law that bans abortion in all cases, including uh, rape and incest, except uh, if the life of the mother is at stake. He's challenging that because there have been new laws passed in like the 70s or in the 80s that dealt with abortion. And his assertion is that because of those laws that are on the books, the ancient 1849 law is, is obsolete, the Wisconsin Supreme Court is gonna weigh in on that. And it may never get to the US Supreme Court after that. So the Wisconsin Supreme Court is gonna be the ultimate arbiter, chances are, on abortion rights in Wisconsin. And we saw how important abortion rights were uh, in the last election in driving turnout. So I think that's something really to stress. Uh, fair maps, it's very likely if there's a new justice who is a progressive that there'll be a challenge to the existing maps right now on the claim that they violate the will of the people under the state constitution here in Wisconsin. And, and so a, a new justice would have the decisive vote right there. Uh, on criminal justice issues, this reactionary Wisconsin Supreme Court we've had has been disastrous on criminal justice issues on Fourth Amendment privacy right issues here in Wisconsin. So if you care about that and on voting rights, I mean, Anjali mentioned that there were at least 10 bills that Governor Evers vetoed. The Republican legislature is going to try to get those through. Uh, you know, if there are a couple people, uh, Democrats in the assembly who are out sick, they might be able to uh, have a, a, a way to overturn the veto there. And, and then the question is, are those laws going to be uh, okay? For instance, on disability rights issues, uh, somehow Republicans got a memo in Wisconsin that people who are disabled are their enemies. And so they passed a lot of bills that Evers vetoed that were going to be really nasty toward persons with disabilities. For instance, the most outrageous bill that was introduced by Republicans in the last legislature would have made it a felony for any employee of a nursing home or long-term care facility, even to tell residents of those facilities that election day is coming up, do you want to vote? Not who to vote for, just do you want to exercise your freedom to vote? Uh, and then similarly, uh, they did uh, pass a bill that said if you're in a long-term care facility or a nursing home and special uh, voting deputies are coming to, uh, to, to run the election there, uh, you have to have your uh, relatives, your immediate relatives, your sisters, brothers, mothers, or fathers notified that that was the day that voting was going to happen. Uh, in the most uh, patronizing way to persons who are living in those facilities. And of course, the Dropbox decision, the Wisconsin Supreme Court got rid of drop boxes, which make it really difficult for people in urban areas and people in rural areas to, to vote. So those are some of the issues that I think may come back to the court or come to the court. Uh, that, and those are reasons why this is a really important uh, election. But if we've learned anything over the last 10 years since Scott Walker, it's that, you know, who gets elected to statewide office is really important. And I know uh, I used to live on the Isthmus of Madison and 
people really cared about who was president of the United States and who was senator, but really didn't care much about state politics. And, and we found out the hard way uh, how wrong that attitude is. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, just to, I agree with everything Matt said. There's also other issues like this guy on the head of the DNR board that refuses to leave. That has been codified by the state Supreme Court. A really terrifying precedent that um, a Fred Pren. I, I Fred Pren, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he's refused to leave and he's casting a decisive, he's creating a conservative majority on a really important state agency. Um, and it's also more scarily a kind of scary precedent that um when your term is up you just stay until you decide what you want um but uh i think you know um just to tag on to what matt and anjali said i think that the race is incredibly important i've been pitching to my editors for the last like 10 years this race is the most important race in the country and each time it's actually true um whether it's the 2018 governor's race the 2020 presidential election Wisconsin is pivotal. And I do think that this particular upcoming race might be a chance for groups like yourselves to, to, uh, to uncork the hold on Republican power. And then it would be up to groups like yourselves whether or not the spirit of Bob LaFollette gets revived. Obviously, it will take a lot of pressure from grassroots organizations to realize that. But one kind of heartening thing is in Michigan, um, one of the first things they're discussing, I don't know if they'll follow through, is repealing the right to work law that was passed there in 2012 when the, the Democrats did take control of both houses of the state legislature for the first time in I think a decade as well. And that would be really important. I think these, these things are both important for their practical um, effect you know obviously right to work in michigan has damaged the labor movement there but it's also a very symbolic victory and i think the right was aware of that by passing act 10 in wisconsin an incredibly storied progressive state and you know same thing in michigan passing a right to work law in the state that created the uaw was just incredibly damaging i think to people in the labor movement there and nationally that um and if the reverse happened i think it would um you know be wind in the back for people for the revival of labor that's happening now across the country you know whether it's starbucks or amazon or um in academia uh, my wife was just on strike at the new school she's part-time faculty they won uh, a victory there and i think all those those victories have a way of kind of giving hope to people involved in similar struggles. And uh, the right has been winning them for a, more than a decade now, but um, you know, perhaps the tide has turned. And I think the, the Wisconsin State Supreme Court is kind of a key linchpin for the conservative hold on power in this state. So I think it's incredibly important. Thanks, Matt, Anjali, and Dan. And again, sorry we can't get to everybody's questions. Um, but I do want to shift gears. Dan mentioned the word victory, and I want to use that to shift gears to think about what is going to be our next victory as we organize uh, around the state Supreme Court race coming into uh, 2023. So I'm going to share my screen here. And Janelle mentioned earlier at the top of the call. Can everybody see my screen? Cool. Um, Janelle mentioned at the top of the meeting that our organization has a history of organizing around democracy, whether it's fair maps, voter registration, um, and empowerment, or our current work to bring Final Five voting to Wisconsin uh, which, with our Bridge the Divide team. We're going to continue that next year into 2023, uh, working to uh, mobilize and organize voters um, to vote and participate in the Wisconsin State Supreme Court race. Our goal is to rally around uh, a pro-democracy candidate. We'll decide who that will be after the election, I mean, after the primary in February. Um, but once that, once we have the candidates who are running in the general, we'll uh, evaluate them and determine who shares our values um, so that we can help move the state back towards a pro-democracy orientation uh, and get back to that original vision of our state being a place where people have a voice, where people are part of uh, making the decisions that impact them. Uh, 
every statewide race in this state seems to be always really close. Uh, and I don't think that this race is gonna be any different. So any ounce of effort we put into this race, I think is gonna be consequential uh, because th these races are so close. Another thing I wanna say is that because we're in Western Wisconsin, we are in a, a part of the state that is um, notoriously a swing part of the state. Um, and we have a really great opportunity uh, to be one of the pivotal places where voters turn out and help decide the fate of this election. So I think we have this really unique advantage just by purely chance where we're located uh, to be in a great place to organize for this for this election. Um, and we've got a plan and I'm really curious, uh, those of you on this call, if you're interested in being part of our plan. Um, so the way we're gonna be approaching this is our, our four tactics are gonna be, uh, first is gonna be deep canvassing where we're gonna be engaging what we call like conflicted voters or, or infrequent voters uh, who aren't part of the choir, uh, who aren't maybe regular participants or political activists or even engaged in politics and have longer conversations with them and help them connect the dots why this election is personally relevant to them. Um, we're also just gonna be doing good old fashioned traditional get out the vote, just letting people know where their polling place is, what the election day is, how they get registered, who's on the ballot, and getting people to, to the, the polls. Um, we're also gonna be doing something called vote tripling. Uh, this is not something we've done before, so we're really excited to try it out and see how it goes. We're always trying to experiment and learn with different tactics. And this is where our volunteers, hopefully some of you, will go out to polling places and just kind of hang out. And as people are walking out after they're, they're voting and they experience their civic high, you know, like they're feeling good, that they, they did their thing, we just ask them, hey, um, would you be willing to send a text to three of your friends just reminding them to vote? And the evidence is really good that this is a, a way to increase turnout because it, what the power is, is that a friend is texting a friend. It's not, oh, just another vote from a faceless campaign reminding you to vote um, or another text from a faceless campaign. It's a friend reminding you. And that's where the power is. Uh, so we're going to be doing that. We're also going to be having an event, hopefully, with one of the candidates where we can have them hear our stories and, and engage with them. So deep canvassing, getting out the vote, vote tripling, and a public event. The way this is all going to unfold is in December, we want to identify folks who are willing to be on a leadership team to take responsibility to make these tactics come to life. Um, in January, we're going to bring that team together and uh, start creating a structure for how the team wants to operate um, and what kind of uh, roles people want to play, what kind of uh, meetings we want to have. And then in February, we're going to start recruiting and training our team of volunteers, getting ready for March when we're going to be doing deep canvassing over the phones from the comfort of your uh, home, your basement, um, or going out to the doors, depending on uh, what kind of march we have in Wisconsin, because it's always a crapshoot, whether it's blizzarding or whether it's like beautiful weather. And then in April, um, when the election comes, we're going to be knocking on doors, getting people, reminding them about the election, hoping to really focus on the campuses in our area, which are which is UW River Falls and UW Stout, um, and also doing that vote tripling on election day. So that's our timeline for how we're hoping that this is all going to be laid out. And for this to happen, we actually need people uh, or, and we need an organized group of people. It's, it's, we can't wave a magic wand and just make that happen. And um, any of you who've been involved in a campaign, um, maybe you had a good experience, maybe not. We really want to run a tight campaign that has clear roles so people know what they're doing. And so we've identified some roles that maybe you're interested and remember, this is only just four months. This, we're not asking folks to dedicate the rest of their life to this campaign. It's gonna, we have four months to get our, get our, uh, our, our machine built and get it running so that in April we're getting voters out. So we need a group of leaders, folks who are actually gonna take responsibility for coordinating this thing and supporting the teams of volunteers that are gonna be uh, doing the phone banking and uh, making the calls to voters over the phone and then folks who are willing to go door to door, which is really the gold standard of voter engagement, actually uh, meeting with somebody face to face. And then also vote tripling volunteers, the people who are interested in just hanging out at vo voting uh, at polling places 
and talking to people who've already voted and asking them to text their friends. And then of course, uh, we're not asking people just to do this all unsupported. We will have an organizer who's going to be supporting uh, folks on the leadership team who are then also going to be supporting the volunteers. So this is a great opportunity for um, those of you who are feeling like you, there's something that needs to be done. This is a great opportunity for you to plug in. And we're really interested uh, in hearing from you if, if this is something that you think is worth your time. Um, the leadership team was going to have separate roles as well. We need somebody who can help coordinate the canvassing. So you're kind of implementing the door knocking side of things, uh, recruiting volunteers, setting up the, uh, maybe handing out the clipboards on the day of the canvas, uh, phone banking leads, actually getting on Zoom and running a phone bank. We can teach you how to do this. It's not hard, I promise. Um, and then if you're kind of like a data nerdy, like me, who likes getting into a database, um, we need people to actually help us create the voter contact lists. And then a volunteer coordinator who can help us recruit and schedule volunteers. And then of course, a team leader. So uh, we're a people powered organization. And like we've been saying throughout the night, democracy doesn't survive without people jumping into the public arena, taking responsibility for the kind of world that we want to live in. Um, and that's our goal over the next four months uh, with this opportunity that's in front of us. Um, so thank you for hearing me and thank you for listening. And I'm just curious, a quick show of hands, how many of you are, are kind of feeling like the moment that we're in is feeling pretty urgent, feeling pretty important? Um, like this is something that seems like a good use of your time. And this is, I'm not asking you for like a full blown commitment, like, uh, but I'm just kind of taking the temperature. Where, where are people at right now? And you could give me like one of these, or I've seen some hands. Wendy's a thumbs up. Danielle just got off of a race, so she's probably uh, Pat. Okay, so there's some. Okay, that's that's really really hopeful to me. Um, and what I'm gonna do, just to like make sure that we can uh, follow up with y'all, I'm gonna drop this link into the chat. And uh, if, oops, and if you're feeling like this could be a good use of your time. I just dropped a link into that chat. Click on that link right now. Uh, there's just a few questions. Just give us your name, contact info, and just let us know if the, one of those roles that I mentioned seems to be jumping out at you. Um, and again, not asking you to commit right here, just kind of getting a sense of where people are at. We can follow up, one of our organizers can follow up or I can follow up and hear more about what, um, where you're feeling like might be a good fit for you, whether that's like a leadership role where you're maybe giving four to eight hours every week, or maybe just a volunteer role where you're just showing up for a phone bank, making some calls and calling it, calling it like that. Um, so please fill out that link. Again, I just dropped it in the chat. You can click on it now and just give us your info. Um, we just have about eight minutes left. And uh, I wanna just, see if there's any questions about the slides that I shared or the plans that we have cooking up uh, through Grow Action. If there's any questions, anybody can come off of mute and I'd be try, happy to try to answer them. Also, I will stay on after the meeting is done if you wanna talk through anything uh, about your potential involvement. Any questions? Hello, this is Larissa. Is someone Hello. else talking? No, no, it's good to hear your voice. Oh, you too, Bill. Hope you're well. Thanks. I'm curious, and this is a crowdsource question, so I don't expect anyone to answer, but who is the youngest person on this meeting? If you think you might be, you know, I'm, I'm curious what our demographic is on this call. I work in marketing. And I'm 20. You're 20. Okay. Do you, so when you think about politics, where do you get most of your messaging? Um, I, I'm unusual, so I don't think I would be a good sample, but um, uh, like um, uh, Twitter, um, uh, most of the people on this meeting, um, uh, Facebook, um, and then yeah. um, like I read the local news and stuff a lot too. 
Sure, sure, absolutely. No, I, I, uh, I'm 39, and so I do Twitter, I do Facebook. Um, I've started TikTok because my younger cousins are on it, and I'm just part of my asking the question was: Is there any one of the TikTok generation where they oh, see I how they get TikTok? Yes, how they get messages out that way, which is very, it's. I mean, you have to be non-traditional, but based on your algorithm, like any platform, it, it gets messages out there. I, but I, I no. do, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No. Um, I do have some thoughts on this. Um, so um, I have some experience with making Facebook posts and stuff. Um, and um, uh, um, pretty much every um, organization that I've been involved with that focused heavily on um, online stuff tended not to um, get as many um, people as um, like, so instead of inviting someone to a Facebook event, like handing them a piece of paper tends to be much more effective. And so um, I, I think a lot of the focus on like getting people to use TikTok um, to get people to vote isn't very effective. Like, um, I think there have been some interesting studies on how effective the, um, like the little banner on like Facebook and stuff that says, oh, go, go vote. Thanks for this conversation. And um, Ingmar, I totally agree with you. Like, and that's kind of the philosophy of our organization is there's value in online engagement, but there's, as human beings who are social animals, there's, uh, and the research bears this out in terms of how do we engage people and how do we move people into action is um, there's so much value in face-to-face -face engagement, whether it's on the phone with another human being or at the doorstep with someone or at the polling place. And that's um, that's how we're focusing and that's how we're we're trying to move move folks in our area. I love this conversation though. And I love I love that TikTok is coming up. Um, it's 756. So I uh, want to see if Anjali, Dan, or Matt have any closing comments. Well, I just, uh, as important as the Wisconsin Supreme Court race is, and it's vitally important, I also think it's important to, to continue with a long-term perspective and, and try to change a few people's minds uh, th that don't already agree with you. People in your social circle, uh, I'm not talking about going knocking on a guy's door whose uh, bumper sticker has a Confederate flag on it. That's not going to be Thank a good you. thing to do. But... I think we all know in our social service, look, half the people in the state voted in a way that I didn't like uh, in 2020. And, uh, and we just can't write all of those people off. And I think we need to find people in our social circles that we can talk to and bring around uh, and bring back from this kind of anti-democracy abyss. And I think if we, if we each of us just find, you know, one or two people that we can try to bring back to reality in a way and to try to look at our vision and, and and taste it anyway i think that would be a uh, one thing that we all can do and i'm trying to do it in my own personal life myself so anyway i, I would commend that to you and anyway i want to thank you all for for being here and i really admire as anjali put in the chat as well all the activism that everyone does uh in your organization it's great great group great people thanks matt I'll just add, I agree with uh, what Matt was saying, and it's a real honor to be here talking to you. And um, I think it's particularly important that you all are, you know, based in Western Wisconsin, which has this wonderful story tradition of La Follette progressivism. And I think groups like yours are really key to, um, you know, the hopeful return of the state to those traditions um, that were, uh, much more, um, I think, yeah, much more positive and um, not just for Wisconsinites, but for the country as a whole. I think it's underappreciated how much Wisconsin's progressive politics has made the United States a better place for a long time, for a good chunk of this, of the past century. And, um, and I think for that reason, it's really important that the grassroots is um, is nurtured in the way that you all are doing it. So um, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to 
share the panel with Matt and Anjali and Bill. Uh, always nice to see you. Nice to see you, Pat. Anjali, you get to finish us off. I just want to say thanks to everybody, to Janelle and Bill for your leadership, for everyone for taking out time in a, a busy um, time of year, potentially after many hours or weeks of work already. And to say, so to say thank you to, to you for your commitment and thank you to you for everything you'll be doing moving forward. And thanks to Matt, Dan, and Anjali for being here. And thanks to all of you for your engagement. And we hope to see you all soon. And happy holidays. And if any of you are interested in hanging out and chatting about our plans, I'll stay on and happy to talk um, right now if you have questions. But otherwise, have a great night. Great night, everyone. Thanks, Phil. Good night. Good night. All right. Thank you. Merry, Merry Christmas. Bye. Happy New Year. Bye. Peace Bye. Bye.